Hello and welcome to another EU4 guide. Today we are looking at the new revolutionary mechanics in game. Revolutionary republics and empires have been part of the game in earlier patches, but the new emperor update has changed the revolutionary mechanics significantly. So let's take a look at how the revolutions work now. In earlier patches, to become a revolutionary, you needed to fire a disaster. You needed to have negative stability and to progress it faster, you needed to have negative prestige and a lot of loans and war exhaustion. So the idea was to no CB someone, then take out a lot of loans, then wait till the revolutionary rebels have occupied the capital and then you became a revolutionary republic. And you could do this only if your capital was in Europe. This has been changed in the new patch. Now there's a better way to become a revolutionary nation. In the age of revolutions, a center of revolution will spawn. When and where this spawns is RNG based, so it might be a while before you see it. In my game, it spawned in 1738. And we have a new map mode for revolution. Here we can see, Wien is the center of revolution and it's slowly converting these three provinces. So it basically works like a center of reformation where the center is converting nearby provinces three at a time. So what happens when the revolution spreads to a province? Once the revolution is fully present, it increases the local minimum autonomy of that province. And this minimum autonomy is based on how much absolutism that nation has. Here we see the province has a minimum autonomy of 54.9 because we have 109 absolutism. So the more absolutism we have, the more autonomous the revolutionary province will be, which makes sense. Now once this revolution has spread to all the provinces in your nation, you can embrace the revolution and become revolutionary. That's the easy way. And it's much easier to do when you don't have that many provinces. But most likely this late in game, you will have a lot more provinces. So in case of Austria here, the revolutionary spread isn't that fast. And since where the revolution spreads is random, you really don't know when you will get to 100% revolution in your provinces. You can wait and be patient, but it's already mid 1700s and not much of the game is left at this point. So we have a couple of alternate ways to become revolutionary. One is to fire the disaster. You can have the revolution disaster in Age of Revolutions if stability is less than two and one of these conditions are met. And if you have more than one conditions met, the disaster will fire faster. Once the disaster fires, you can choose to go either revolutionary or not. Either way, you'll have to fight the rebels. But really, if you don't want to go revolutionary, you can just let the disaster not fire. It's not hard to stop, you just need plus three stab. Also, if you become revolutionary via the disaster, you start with maximum revolutionary zeal, which we'll talk about in a bit. The second way to become revolutionary republic is to go to war against someone who is already revolutionary using the crush the revolution CB. Then offer tribute to spread the revolution to you. This strategy is easier if you can find a miner nearby who has embraced the revolutionary ideas. However, you will lose some prestige and some monarch points and the other nation is going to get all that prestige and monarch points. So you are now a revolutionary republic and we get to see another new mechanic here the revolutionary target. Being a revolutionary target gives a lot of good modifiers. More morale, manpower, force limit, maintenance, war exhaustion reduction, and unjustified demands. That is a lot of modifiers. There can only be one revolutionary target at a time though. And we got the revolutionary target bonus here because the other nations that became revolutionary before us were not a great power. So you need to be a great power to be eligible to become a revolutionary target and any other revolutionary nation can claim the revolutionary target bonuses. There is a one year cooldown on when a nation becomes a revolutionary target. And if you want to claim the bonus, you need to have at least 20 revolutionary zeal and more revolutionary zeal than the target nation. Which brings us to the other new revolutionary mechanic, the revolutionary zeal. It's basically a replacement for absolutism for revolutionary nations. Similar to absolutism, there's a max revolutionary zeal and a current one, and both has modifiers from government reforms and events. Revolutionary zeal also takes down when you are not at war though, so you need to be at war constantly to keep the zeal higher. At 100% revolutionary zeal, you get 30% admin efficiency, which compared to absolutism is a bit weaker as you get 40% admin efficiency from 100% absolutism. You also don't get any discipline from zeal. Instead, you get plus 20% special unit force limit, which is a scaling modifier, obviously. 
and that segues us into the next revolutionary mechanic. We now get some new revolutionary regiments. There are four tier of these regiments. We can hire the tier one mass revolutionary guards when we become revolutionary. Then we can hire professional guards at 40% army professionalism, vanguard revolutionary guards at 60% professionalism, and elite revolutionary guards at 80% professionalism. These special units don't count towards the force limit. I'm not going to get into details at this point because I think they are going to need some balance changes in the upcoming patch. They seem fairly useful on paper though, but I think they might be better used in multiplayer than single player games. Next, let's look at the new government reforms we get from the Revolutionary Republics because these also have been buffed in the new patch and some of these bonuses are really strong. As a revolutionary republic, we start with 10% morale of armies, plus 2 tolerance of heretics, and minus 0.2 monthly autonomy change, which is huge. We also get plus 50 max revolutionary zeal, and since we are a republic now, we can take plutocratic ideas, which is one of my favorite idea group, and it's worth taking even this late in game. Also, the 4 years term limit is pretty good. This reform also enables 3 factions, Jacobins, Imperials, and Girondists. With Jacobins in power, we can get minus 15% construction cost, minus 2 national unrest, plus 15% tax modifier, and also minus 2 diplorep, which at this point in game doesn't really hurt that much. The Imperials in power give minus 25% state maintenance, plus 1 diplorep, minus 20% liberty desire, and minus 0.5 yearly republican tradition. So these ones aren't super useful. The Girondists in power give manpower recovery bonus, land force limit bonus, and extra plus 5% discipline, but also plus 20% aggressive expansion, which is significant, but it will depend on how strong you are in game at this point. And you can boost which faction you want in power by spending a small amount of diplo points. You can even cheese this a bit by changing the bonuses for when you need them, say keeping the Girondists in power when in war, but right before piecing out you can change it to the Jacobins. The tier 2 government reforms give us the option between plus 2 max promoted cultures, plus 0.25 yearly republican tradition, and minus 20% culture conversion cost and minus 25% harsh treatment cost. If you're playing as a republic, the plus 0.25 yearly republican tradition is always great. Tier 3 reforms lets us choose between plus 1.5 yearly revolutionary zeal, an improved relations modifier, and plus 1 diplomat. Clearly, the yearly zeal here is the better choice. Tier 4 reforms give minus 25% state maintenance, plus 250 governing capacity, and plus 10% global trade power. Again, the best choice here will depend on what kind of game you are playing, but governing capacity seems like the best choice here. Tier 5 reforms give minus 10% institution embracement cost, and you likely only have one institution left to embrace at this point, that's the new industrialization institution, minus 10% staff cost modifier, and minus 0.1 yearly republican tradition. This also enables the revolutionary versus monarchist mechanic. The third option gives us plus 0.15 republican tradition and one free policy. The revolutionary's monarchist mechanic gives us some interesting bonuses. We get to choose a monarchist or revolutionary candidate at elections, and depending on which way you choose, you can get on the revolutionary side another 10% army morale, plus 0.1 yearly republican tradition, and plus 0.25 revolutionary zeal. While on the monarchist side, we get minus 1 national unrest, plus 10% manpower recovery, and plus 1 diplo rep. So this is a good reform to take if you want some extra morale for your armies, and it's going to be more important in multiplayer games than single player ones. Tier 6 reform gives us minus 15% stab cost modifier, plus 1 diplomat, all power costs minus 5%, and plus 1 length of election term, and minus 1 length of election terms and plus 10 max revolutionary zeal. This one is interesting. Earlier in game, I would have leaned towards the minus 1 length of election term, because you can generate a lot of monarch points with republics that way, but this late in game, I think minus 5% all power costs is a better option. The max revolutionary zeal isn't a huge deal, because you can get close to 100 zeal when all your provinces are revolutionary. Tier 7 reform has 5 options, plus 1 admin policy, plus 1 diplo policy, more morale and manpower modifiers, plus 2 tolerance for both heretics and heathens, and minus 10% aggressive expansion and minus 10% province war score cost. These are some really good modifiers and what you choose here will depend on what type of game you are playing. For a full expansionist game, the province war score cost is really good. Tier 8 reforms have a clear favorite with minus 10% core cost reduction. You can choose one of the other two that gives unrest reduction and tax modifier or army tradition and land leader fire if you are playing a tall game. 
Tier 9 reforms give minus 5% visor cost and plus 1 possible advisor, minus 10% minimum autonomy in territories, and plus 1 max promoted culture. If you have a large empire, taking autonomy reduction here might be the best reform. And finally, with tier 10 reform, you can choose between plus 1 admin policy and minus 10% re-election cost, which is pretty good, minus 0.5 republican tradition with plus 1 monarch admin and military skill, and there won't be regular elections here, or plus 20 maximum revolutionary zeal. Now, if you are a revolutionary republic, you can also switch the government type to a revolutionary empire. And you can do that by boosting imperial's influence using some diplo points. It's pretty easy. And just like that, you're back to being a monarchy. We get a new ruler and we get new reforms. Most of these reforms are the same as the revolutionary republic one, so I won't go over each one of them. And at the end of these reforms, if you're feeling very dissatisfied from being a monarchy, you can go back to being a revolutionary republic. A couple of more important points about revolutionary empire. First, you don't have to pass all the government reforms to become revolutionary empire. You can just tank your republican tradition by taking options that decrease traditions in events and putting the imperialists in power. Then at zero tradition, you will get an event about rise of a despot and the government will become a revolutionary empire. And another important thing to remember is that you cannot switch off the revolutionary republic government type if you are not the revolutionary target. So if you plan on becoming the revolutionary empire, you need to claim the revolutionary target first. Now let's say you don't want to go revolutionary, but you see these revolutionary ideas popping up all around you, and because of it, you have the terrible negative modifier of counter-revolution. So it's time to end the revolution yourself. You can declare a war against a revolutionary target using Crush the Revolution CB. This will remove the counter-revolution modifiers and give us reaction modifiers, which are really amazing. Then you can dismantle the revolution and end it. The country will return back to being a monarchy again, and this will also remove the center of revolution. However, I think another center can appear after some time in a random province. I am not sure about the meantime to happen on that right now. And that's all about the new revolutionary mechanics in game. I think they are great. I like the modifiers they give. I like how they spread. I like most things about it. With both these new revolutionary mechanics and the hegemon mechanics, the devs are trying to spice up late game EU4, right? Which I think everyone can agree was really stale in previous patches. So it's great to see this change. However, now that the revolution can start anywhere in the world, what are the chances that revolution will spread to you naturally? It's probably not very likely. And since the center of revolution only appears in the last 100 years of game, you won't really have time to wait for the revolution to spread to you. So in order to become revolutionary, we will still have to fire the disaster and become revolutionary that way. Or lose a war to a revolutionary nation and embrace revolution. There's other cool flavor like the Ottomans become revolutionary Turkey. Similarly, Ming is renamed to revolutionary China. Mughals are renamed to revolutionary Gurkhani, which apparently was the Timurid dynasty name. And I think, like most things in the new 1.30.1 patch, the new revolution mechanics are fantastic, but they need more tweaking. And we will likely see some balance changes to it in the upcoming patches. I'm curious to know if any of you have tried the revolutionary mechanics yet, or are you still avoiding playing late game EU4? And if you have tried them, what do you think about it? Let me know in comments. That's all from my side today. You were watching a Radio's Guide. Thank you for your time and I'll see you all in the next one.